welcome. My name is Maurice Rose. I'm chair of the Department of Visual and Performing Arts, where I teach art history and visual culture. I welcome you to the second day of our symposium, The View from Africa, Greco-Roman Antiquity Through an African Lens. This is the second event sponsored by the Vincent J. Roosevelt Lecture Series in Ancient Mediterranean Studies in honor of the memory of our late colleague, Vin Roosevelt. We are grateful to his family for making this possible. We are also grateful to Dr. Catherine Schwab for her vision for the symposium and her organizational brilliance. Dr. Ruffini and I helped, but this event would not be running smoothly or at all without her. Can we give a round of applause to Dr. Schwab? I'd also like to acknowledge our co-sponsors, the College of Arts and Sciences, the Program in Art History and Visual Culture of the Department of Visual and Performing Arts, and the Fairfield University Art Museum. Please visit Egyptian objects on display, among other fabulous things, downstairs in the museum during the break or afterward. Also helping us were Melissa Roberto, Program Coordinator for Classical Studies, Francis Yadre, Assistant to the Dean, Tess Long, Senior Manager of Integrated Marketing, and the Media Center. The symposium's description states, modern scholars focused for too long on the Greco-Roman vision of Africa or on Africa's passive reception of classical antiquity. Now, we are starting to put these civilizations at the center of the story to learn about their place in the ancient world and understand their role as active agents in a constant exchange of goods and ideas within the ancient Mediterranean. Last night, we heard a wonderfully thought-provoking keynote by Dr. Roger Bagnall, and we have a terrific program for you today as well. This morning, there will be two presentations, each 20 minutes long, followed by discussion. So please save questions on the first paper until after the second, and we welcome your questions. We will then pause for a 15-minute break. Two presentations will follow that, and then another Q&A. The program will conclude at 12.30, and lunch will be served for those of you who are still here. <laughs> I'm happy to welcome our first presenter, Dr. Andrea Acci. Dr. Acci is an assistant curator at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in the Department of Medieval Art. Dr. Acci's scholarship focuses on late antique and Byzantine art of the Mediterranean Basin and Northeast Africa. She specializes, specializes in manuscripts and artifacts from Christian Egypt and Nubia. She has brought this expertise to bear on exhibitions at the Met, including Art and Peoples of the Karga Oasis in 2017 and The Good Life in 2021, as well as in presentations and publications. She is currently curating a major international loan exhibition at the Met. Dr. Achi received her BA from Barnard College and a PhD from the Institute of Fine Arts of New York University. Join me in welcoming Dr. Achi. First, um, thank you to the organizers for inviting me to this, uh, speak at this symposium with this timely topic. I'm honored to be here, and it's lovely to be able to give a presentation in person. A fifth century chess from Nubia shifts perceptions about Byzantine art production and sources. Assuming the form of a multi-story mahogany house, the chess 21 ivory panels depict the gods Bess, Dionysus, Zeus Amun, Perseus, and features the goddess Aphrodite with sirens and satyrs. Generally, ivory and bone inlays decorated couches, chests, and other furniture. Some were carved in relief, others were carved with incised designs, often filled with colored wax paste. Both styles could be used on the same object. These minor arts decorated late antique domestic spaces throughout North Africa and the Mediterranean basin. Yet intact wood and ivory furniture from archeological contexts are quite rare. The focus of this presentation is the object on the screen a nearly complete chest discovered at a royal cemetery in a region we now call Nubia. The chest motifs relate to late antique ideas of fertility and prosperity. And the Nubian chest is often described as a bridal chest and also an imported object from Byzantine Egypt. To explain this link, I will first review a small corpus of late antique Egyptian bone, ivory, and wood boxes from Alexandria in light of previous research. Then, this contribution considers the context in which the Nubian chest was made, used, and buried through a reanalysis of 20th century archeological and conservation reports from Nubian sites. 
Ultimately, I argue that the chest was indeed produced in Nubia, a region where skilled craftsmen and artisans created masterful works of art out of wood, ivory, and metal. In the early Byzantine period, so around 4th to 7th century AD, the presence of mythological figures on everyday objects was not a reflection of the owner's religious backgrounds. Instead, their allegorical meanings represented an appreciation of classical ideas, ideals that persisted in late antiquity. And these motifs appeared on objects on the eastern and western Mediterranean, but they're closely associated with Alexandria. Alexandria in late antiquity was a cosmopolitan town. It was a center, an intellectual, economic, and religious center, kind of like New York or Paris today. Documentary sources indicated that Alexandria had a vast ivory industry from the ancient to medieval periods, and that ivory was a major export from the Aksumite kingdom, so Ethiopia, from the first century. As supplies to the Mediterranean increased, we see a fall in the value of ivory in the Diocletian price control edict. Ivory is usually associated with elephant upper incisors, but many animals grow ivory, including hippopotamus and white rhinos. And after the third century extinction of the North African elephant, the Indian Ocean and Red Sea trade routes were the sources of these ivories with expeditions that went to Central and Southern Sudan, Eritrea and Somalia and India. Professor Bagnall talked about these trade routes yesterday. Carbon and nitrogen uh, isotope analysis on traces of collagen in ivory objects has helped scholars identify the sources of these elephants. Between 1992 and 2004, French excavation teams working in Alexandria discovered thousands of card, bone, and ivory at 11 separately excavated sites. The excavations establish a framework of chronological data that has allowed art historians to estimate the dates comparable, of comparable fragments in public and private collections. The French also discovered furniture workshop sites and these sites' rubbish pits located inside the city walls and near the city center allows us to understand the making of these important luxury materials. For example, through excavations, we now assume that the production of bone and ivory plaques might also be related to carpenters and wood carvers. These plaques made their ways into museums, primarily as bits and pieces, but some were attached to wood, others connected to boxes reconstructed on the art market. And most do not have provenance, provinces, but the material is generally thought to be from Egypt, based on the archaeological data from Alexandria. And many bone and ivory plaques from Alexandria were used as overlays and wooden caskets, and the boxes or, or caskets associated with Alexandria have pyramid-shaped lids. Many scholars believe that um, these particular boxes function in antiquity as wedding gifts. These boxes apparently were a part of a woman's dowry and represented essential furniture elements in ancient houses as jewelry storage. However, I haven't found many primary sources that describes these types of boxes as wedding gifts or dowries, so if anyone knows of a lot of primary um, sources of documented evidence for this practice, please let me know. Almost all of the plaques and museum collections have mythological or nihilistic scenes painted with red, black, green, blue, and yellow color paste. For example, these plaques in the Coptic museums are well preserved and enter the museum with these wooden supports. One of the best preserved examples of this type of wooden box inlaid with, bone, with both bone and ivory panels, decorated with birds and mythological figures, um, relates to themes of prosperity and good fortune. And the plaques are mostly incised with red and black wax, and two different styles are used on the box, which indicates that the variety of plaques found at archaeological sites could be used on one object. The conservators at the British Museum have not attempted to open the box. In fact, they call this a Pandora box. But they did do an x-ray um, analysis on the object and discovered this box was lined with a textile, and this appears to be glued shut with a strong adhesive. The box is empty. Another example of a wooden and bone box associated with Alexandria is a box now, box now in the Walters Museum. Again, two different techniques were used to create the bone plaques on the side and on the top. The carver scraped away the background and leaping the figures in raised relief, and on others, deep fine lines were carved first and filled with colored wax. So I share these examples just to adjust your eyes to the styles and techniques and motifs used on plaques found in Alexandria and in boxes associated with the city. Let's turn to Nubia in late antiquity. After the fall of Meroe, sometime in the fourth century, the region we now call Nubia was divided into three zones, 
and John episodes describe the latent teak territory between the first cataract and the region of modern Khartoum as three separate and independent kingdoms. And different chronologies of these states developed separately for Nabatia, Makura, and Alwa. And luxury products such as ivories were the mainstay of the kingdom's trade relations with the Mediterranean. Out of the 398 archaeological settlements dating from the Meroitic to the Christian periods, most were connected to the burial of the dead. Because of, this because of this, our understanding of late antique Nubia is skewed to what was discovered in the tombs of two sites, Balana and Kostum, in the Norbatia region. The twin cemeteries of Balana and Kostum stood directly opposite on the west and east banks of the Nile. Low domed mounds of each site are visible here. The rulers of the region would trade partners with Egypt. And the sample of grave goods that have been discovered at the sites have been described as a result of these strong partnerships. So apparently elites in Nobadia accumulated wealth, gathered knowledge, and extended this sphere of influence onto the rest of the population. The site of Kostul is likely older than Balana, with the graves dating to the fourth century to the, uh, to the fifth century, late fifth century, representing four royal generations. And the tombs contain a variety of materials, jewelry, weapons, horse equipment, silver vessels, iron caskets, bronze vessels, games, tables, tripods, lamps, incense burners, leatherwork, textiles, and pottery. And I want to reiterate the abundance of metal found here because hundreds of metal vessels were discovered. Our Nubian chest was found in tomb Q14 in Kostul, which was excavated in 1930s. And tomb Q14 was probably the grave of, of non-moral. The grave was likely plundered shortly after it was buried. And a female skeleton was found at the front of the grave with her neck slit. But next to her was a bag of um, jewelry and um, a, a leather bag and also precious items wrapped in bundles of linen. For the grave goods, there were more leather bags of jewels and metal spears, pottery, bracelets made out of silver and coral, metal plaques decorated with amethyst, and a bronze hanging lamp in the form of a dove. So until the late 1970s, most assumed that most of all of the luxury goods in the coastal graves were imported from Egypt specifically Alexandria, as these imports um, probably represented status symbols. The large rectangular wooden chest with four legs was discovered just outside the forecourt, as you saw previously, under the debris of the burial. Archaeological reports describe the chest as being forced open and its contents stolen. It was found lying on its side with its lid torn off, and the only contents were a few coral and glass beads. The front is elaborately inlaid with ivory decoration, and the panels with red and green wax. The two sides in the back are plain. The hinges of the back are iron, and two bronze claps are buttressed by seated lions, which is hard to see and difficult to photograph. The lock is elaborately engraved with fine patterns and circles, and the two lions are attached to a rectangular bronze lock with a loop handle below it. And since the wood was so fragile, the archaeologists found it impossible to remove the lock to understand how it worked. So the robbers actually cut through the caps, and you can see the cuts. The figures on the panels decorating the chest are arranged in four registers and are surrounded by vine tendrils and circular motifs. And the painted ivory panels are stylistically different from most of the Alexandrian bone panels I discussed earlier. The plaques are arranged, as I mentioned, in four registers, but um, the images are between columns and niches and arches. And the columns um, and niches may refer to the facade of a multi-story Levantine building or perhaps the theater. It is of note that the chest is made with ivory, mahogany, and acacia wood. The incised figures represent the household gods, Bess and his attendants, sirens and satyrs killing mythological enemies. We also see a representation of an Aphrodite-like goddess. This female figure is shown with a mirror or patra in her hand. These figures certainly parallel the iconographic repertory of late antique boxes, but the addition of the Egyptian bas here is interesting, as we do not see the bas on Alexandrian boxes. Like the Byzantine Egyptian boxes, the motifs relate to fertility in the aspects of the good life. 
The prominent scholar of late antique Egypt and Nubia, Lazar Torek, described this casket as a bridal chest because of the iconography of the decorations representations was meant to hint at the religious aspects of marriage. When the chest was discovered, another scholar, von Bessing, believed that the chest was made in Alexandria because of the use of quote-unquote classicizing motifs and styles. But terms such as classicizing and Egyptian sizing styles are often described, are used to describe this box and other examples found in other late antique Nubian sites. But I would suggest we shift focus and shift our focus on what is specifically Nubian about this chest, its materials, and its functions. For example, this box was excavated in 1908 by the University of Pennsylvania's museum's archaeologist, Wally and Randa McCleaver, at Karanong, the provincial capital of Meroe. The excavated area included a town with both elites and middle-class houses and a cemetery with numerous grave goods, including this box from grave 45. The box was decorated with inlaid um, divine figures represented in niche and arcade architecture. Uh, line motifs are also represented on the box. Notice the void right here. It originally had a bronze lock, which was removed for conservation reasons. Then we have another box from Jebel Atta, um, which was also in the uh, Nobidia region. Um, and Cemetery 3 is fascinating because of the discovery abundance of wood and ivory boxes such as this. But also for the burials of blacksmiths whose graves included tongs, hammers, and trimming files. So in addition to inlaid boxes, you know, archaeologists found leather, pottery, jewelry, and textiles, and a significant amount of glass that was also found on the site. Although the archaeological reports assume that these boxes were made in quote-unquote Byzantine Egypt, almost all of the other grave girds were clearly locally produced. So I'm still trying to track down this box, which was deposited in the Egyptian Museum after the excavation. And the archaeological reports do not describe the colors on the box. But even with the grainy image, we can see on the lower register, Aphrodite, flanked by Her uh, Hippocrates, you can see with his um, finger touching his mouth associating her with Isis and Hathor. The themes of the box hint towards female fertility. Also notice the lock and metal clasp. The archaeological report explains that the lock appeared to have been forced open in antiquity. The contents were removed, but the fragments of bead bracelets remain. As far as I know, no boxes of this type have been found in archaeological contexts from late Roman or Byzantine Egypt. However, a wooden box now in the British Museum slightly complicates the issue of attribution. The box has a bronze, and handles, bronze handles and a lock and laid ivory figures at the front. The museum purchased a box in 1912 from the Egyptian antiquities dealer Mohammed Maghzib, who, has been, who was born and raised in Luxor. Maghzib told the museum that the chest was from Egypt. Because of this Egyptian provenance given by the dealer, Almost all similar boxes or chests excavated from Nubia were compared to this box and were deemed to be Egyptian, Byzantine Egyptian imports. So this is problematic for several reasons, mainly because we now put more faith in archaeological reports than reports from the art market. But the antiquities dealer was likely telling the truth. The Egyptians annexed ter the territory in Sudan in the 19th century. And on its greatest extent, Egypt included modern-day Chad, Eritrea, Djibouti, and Somalia. In 1912, Balana and Castile were within the colonial borders of Egypt. And what is today Sudan was called Anglo-Egyptian Sudan. Sudan did not gain independence from Egypt and the United Kingdom until 1956. So, but in the late antique period, it's possible that this British, British Museum box in 1912 was in Egypt, but in the late antique period was made in the Kingdom of Nubia. Describing the art of late antique Nubia, Turek notes that despite a, the predominance, predominance of Hellenistic and Byzantine influence in the art and the abundance of Byzantine Egyptian imports, a few of the items found at Balana and Kostul follow the artistic ideological tradition of Meroitic and Pharaonic times, notably the, the crowns that were found in the graves. The crowns are broad circles of beaten silver. They're 
have richly encrusted, um, they're richly encrusted with various gems, adorned with royal and divine insignia. The divine motifs included representation of Horus, Iris, and a ram's head, symbolizing a syncretic Amun and the old Nubian god, Kum. Some crowns have human figures with the plumed Atif crown, um, one of the traditional symbols of pharaonic authority. The crowns were often in the same graves as the wood and ivory chest and boxes. And the assemblage together placed the boxes within the indigenous context. The crowns were found on or near the heads of skeletons in the burials. As I mentioned above, hundreds of bronze and iron and steel spears, axes and chisels and hammers were uncovered from Verlana and Castul. And graves of blacksmiths were also discovered in this period. Recent research on mining in Sudan has shown extensive iron mines in the region until the sixth century. Archaeologists have found large slag mounds, and Jane Humphreys recently published research on where the iron mines were located and the mining techniques that were practiced in the region. And as a result of this research, it has been established that metalworking was an indigenous trade. Let's go back to the box. So the box of chest was discovered the metal has already been piled open. The archaeologists tried to open the lock but could not because of the lock's structure was so intricate. Although no scientific analysis has been done on this particular chest, the consensus is that from the archaeological reports and recent conservation reports that the metal appears to be the same as those used on other objects in the graves, particularly the swords that were found in the graves. All the chests found in Nubia have these metal clasps and locks, unlike the ones in Alexandria, which have the pyramid-shaped tops. I believe that the flat top with a lock is a defining feature of the Nubian boxes. Overall, the archaeological assemblages point to most grave goods not being imported. Instead, there were luxury goods made in the region by regional artisans. Thus, the material, style, and iconography suggest that these boxes were not imported from Egypt, but made in Nubia and represent a visual conversation between late antique Egyptian and Nubian art. Before I conclude, I want to share an anecdote about methodology, and why it's essential to not immediately assume that the good, beautiful things found in Nubia are foreign imports. When many Western medievalists see the coastal box, they immediately make a formal connection to the throne of St. Peter. The front of this throne is made with three registers of ivory plaques with trials of Hercules, and there's cosmopolitan and combat themes. Kate Weissman notably tried to parse the issues of the plaques productions and functions, and Lauren Neese dates this box to the 9th century and suggests that it was created in connection to the Charles de Bald. I'm not showing this chair to indicate a connection to the Nubian chess, but I end with it to highlight that classical motifs on bones and ivories persisted in the east and west and south in different contexts for different uses. Yet when most scholars study an object like this in the west, their first reaction is not immediately to turn to Alexandria, a center known for producing materials and similar media and themes. Following this approach, I ask us not to immediately assume that luxury materials found in late antique Nubia are imports. The bottle chest I discussed today is part of a long legacy of wood, bone, and ivory boxes made and used in sites in present-day Sudan. And at the same time, a part of a broader artistic tradition of making ivory gods in the Byzantine and medieval worlds. In my introduction, I suggested that the understanding of the chest might allow us to glean a bit about late antique Nubian identity. There's much about this topic that we do not know. For example, we can't be confident that the populations in these regions in Nubia would have considered themselves as having a unified identity, despite perhaps some sharing religious, linguistic, and some social cultural similarities. And of course, it's challenging to discern identity based on elite funerary material alone. However, I contend that most of the luxury products found in the elite burials of Kastul and Balana are indigenous products and not imports from Byzantine Egypt. Filling one's tombs with imported goods versus indigenous works made by indigenous artisans suggests a particular type of value system. 
As such, my contribution helps us point to understanding one facet of late antique Nubian society, but still much more work needs to be done. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Achi. Um, now we have time for questions. Thank you so much. Two questions, actually. One is whether I found your argument so convincing and big picture and really exciting. I wonder if there's any evidence from these boxes that can be gleaned about provenance from preservation rates. Would we expect a written test from Alexandria to preserve? as well as the examples from Nubia that you cited? And can that be a mechanism for speaking to provenance in art market objects? Do you mean the conservation from Alexandria? Like, how, would we be able to understand provenance more with those types of reports? From preservation of the object itself. Yeah. Like, I would imagine Alexandria would be in you know, humidity. It, it just wouldn't preserve a wooden object, wouldn't preserve at the same rate mm -hmm. as the Nubian examples from graves. Is yeah. that a, an inroad for thinking about provenance? Yeah. Um, so you're right. Like for, because I just say that there's no archaeological boxes uh, in the late Roman. Um, um, sites and conservation is a big um, issue and so I mean that's a really good point um, but we do see the boxes I and mean, the ivory plaques on some wooden um, supports that have been preserved and especially the Coptic Museum one that has that pyramid shape I just think like the way that the, um, the sources that we do have looks it, it seems that the conservation that we uh, see in um, Alexandria and in those regions don't really relate to the Nubian sites, if that makes sense. I'm just wondering if we know enough about Nubian antique domestic architecture to know if it's actually modeling the real Nubian house. Right, that's a really great question. So in the Penns Museum, they have models um, of um, two or three-story houses that have these arches, and so that's one of the reasons why people talk about it as a house. Um, and that architecture, they said, model is Alexandrian architecture, which I think is a little bit problematic. But we have um, archaeological evidence of um, late antique Nubian um, houses from um, Gebel Ada and um, those um, regions that are multi storied with those types of windows. But it could also be a theater. Like there's a lot of other um, late antique architectural structures beyond the domestic spaces that could emulate. Could the reattribution of these works to local Nubian artists function to legitimize um, ancient Nubia and Sudan as a place for greater archaeological research? That's part of that. I think the next step in this research is really thinking about what might be Nubian about Byzantine Egyptian art or what, like, late Roman Mediterranean art. Um, and the questions on how to do that, right? And I think the, the conservation reports and um, archaeological, um, I mean, scientific analyses might help. I'm um, thinking about um, where ivories were made. And I mean, there's just so much more work to be done. But I think the first part is kind of parsing out the fact that these objects um, in Nubia were made there. And then we can go from there. Thank you so much, Dr. Hachi.